Thank you much. What I'm going to try to go over in a relatively short period of time is how to determine when you have true progression of disease, financial disclosures. So really, the goal of therapy should be the prevention of sequelae, not just stabilization of disease. And if you think about it in the past, if you go back a generation, all we really had was penetrating keratoplasty or contact lenses, which treated disease after you lost vision. This has been our approach in the past. We call this an idiot light. It lets you know too late that some, something is wrong. But really, our approach should really be this. We need to be able to monitor disease early enough to prevent the problem before it occurs. And the real problem is that people are still utilizing this, Amsler Prumac. And I'll bet you, you go on the floor during this meeting, you'll hear people still say stage one, stage two. And it's pretty much a useless classification considering the modern treatments that we currently have. What's the limitation of Amsler Prumac? Well, one, it relies on apical th thickness. And if you look over on the map on the, on the right, this is a cornea that actually thins down to 499. But the apical reading is 520. And Amsler Prumac was really a classification from 1947 using a keratometer and an optical pachymeter. Most of you don't even know what an optical pachymeter is any, any, anymore. The real limitation is this, how, how, however. It completely ignores early disease. For those of you familiar with the Bell and Ambrosia display, this is a highly abnormal cornea. But if you look at the left side, a completely normal anterior surface. We call this subclinical. This isn't sub suspect, suspicious. This is an abnormal eye with keratoconus that has a normal anterior surface. Prominent posterior ectasia, abnormal pachymetric progression, but early disease. Again, amzacrumac completely ignores early or subclinical disease. So what do we need? We need some way to describe that recognizes all the anatomical changes, both the anterior surface, the posterior surface, the corneal thickness. We need simple parameters. It should be somewhat platform independent, as long as it's a tomographic device, because we need to be able to see the posterior cornea. And we need to be able to convey the information in somewhat of an easy fashion. And the reason for that is we have new modalities. It's no longer just penetrating keratoplasty for advanced disease or contact lenses. We have cross-linking, we have rings, we have DALC, we have PK, we have R R RGP. So we came out with a, a new classification called the Bell and ABCD. It's a confusing slide, but basically what it does, it looks at three anatomical layers. The anterior surface, which is A, the posterior or back B, C for corneal thickness, and D is distance vis visual acuity. And what we measure, rather than a single point like K-max, we look at a three millimeter optical zone surrounding the thinnest point of the cornea for the anterior surface, the posterior surface, we use the absolute thinnest point of the cornea, and best spectacle corrected distance visual acuity. It's currently available on the Pentacam. It's part of the topometric keratoconus staging dis display. And I'll blow up the actual portion right here. And here you can see a, a cornea that has true subclinical disease, A0, a normal anterior surface a very big prominent posterior ectasia, B4, moderately thin cornea, C3, but good distance visual acuity because the anterior surface is normal. And we actually have three different things we're showing you on this. This is the actual classification. These graph here shows you each stage and will actually show you in decimal points where it is. So in other words, let's say you have someone, you're doing weights and people weigh between 120 and 140. Someone who weighs 121 and 139 are different. So this will just give you that classification. This gives you the number, and this gives you the actual raw data. So that's the anterior rays of curvature, posterior rays of curvature, minimal corneal thickness, and distance visual acuity. But the real reason we developed this was not to get a classification or a staging, to be able to utilize this to determine when and if you have true progression of disease. And we needed to know when you have true progression. There's a number of commonly used progression parameters, a huge list here. Most of these have not been validated. K-max is probably the most commonly used, but most of us recognize the limitation of K-max. It's a single point data, one single point in the cornea. In addition, it completely ignores the posterior cornea. So what we needed to do is we needed to determine the background noise for each of these parameters. Now, the A and B parameters were new parameters. Again, anterior rays of curvature taken from a three millimeter zone surrounding the thinnest point and the corneal thickness at, at the thinnest point. And we determined it was very important to look at two populations, both normal and keratoconic. And the reason for that is, for your older patients with clinically evident keratoconus, the noise levels from the keratoconic population is probably more appropriate. And again, in the older population, it's less likely to see rapid disease, so the risk of waiting is low. But in your younger patient, with very early or subclinical disease, the change probably more closely mimics the normal population. Again, younger person, 
uh, with normal vision and subclinical disease, the risk of waiting is much higher. And these are actually what we came up with. And if you notice the noise levels, we look at confidence intervals one-sided because we're only looking at thinning or steepening. And you'll notice, again, the noise levels in the keratoconic are substantially higher than the normal, which is what we would expect. And we've come up with this progression display. And it will currently show you up to eight exams over time. It will show you when you've reached statistical change, both in an 80 and 95% confidence interval in both a normal and a keratoconic pop population. The keratoconic population is in red. The 95% confidence interval is a solid line. The 80% is a dash line. The normal population is in green. So you can choose what risk aversion you want. Do I compare it against a keratoconic? Do I compare it against a normal population? And we also list 10 different parameters you, you can follow that aren't shown graph, graphically. Let's look at an example here. This is a 15-year-old early keratoconus, one-year follow-up. You notice, again, the anterior surface remained re relatively stable, but notice the statistically significant change in the posterior cornea. Asymptomatic individual, abnormal cornea, progressive disease in spite of good visual acuity. Here's another 15-year-old you'll see here. Again, 21-month follow-up, changes on the anterior surface in one eye, changes on the posterior surface on the other eye. Again, statistically significant change. This, however, I think is one of the most uh, best examples of, of the validity of, or the util utilization of this display. This is a patient who had asymmetric keratoconus. They were cross-linked in the other eye. Both the patient and the physician decided, since I'm asymptomatic in my other eye, why don't we just wait and see because of the expense of cross-linking and the potential com com complications. And if you look at the exam here, they were 20-20 visual acuity. And four years later, the patient came in because they now lost two, two lines loss of vision. However, retrospectively, we analyzed this patient. And if you notice, not four years later, but by the second exam, they had highly statistically significant change. The surgeon and the patient could have intervened at this date and preserved good visual acuity, not waiting until you had loss of vision. So again, Progression is determined by the ABC dis dis display, and my recommendation is a single parameter at 95% confidence interval or two at the 80%. Thank you.